been about two months since I last brewed, and as you can tell from my overly sweaty appearance, we are in the middle of summer, and I am craving a light, sessionable, crisp, refreshing lager. Today we're making a Czech Pale Lager, which is gonna hit every single one of those categories. I'm actually gonna be starting a little bit of a Czech Lager series off of this video. Uh, technically, I've already done the Czech Dark Lager that was done last year, so I've checked that video out if you're curious about that. It turned out really, really good, but today we're gonna be doing the Czech Pale Lager. Within the BJCP category of Czech Lagers, there are are several different kinds, but Czech Pale Lager is by far the lightest colored and the lightest in alcohol content, which actually makes it a pretty significant challenge to get it right because that means there's zero things to hide any flaws behind. Lately, I've noticed my tastes for beer have really been changing quite a bit, not only as a brewer, but also as a craft beer consumer. And I started out way back in the day, you know, drinking your typical American fizzy light lagers. Uh, and that was fine for a while. And then I discovered craft beer and I really got into highly flavored beers like stouts and IPAs and went on a Belgian kick for a while. And then now I'm coming back around and I'm finding myself just craving a simple, delicious, well-made lager. Um, and I've really gotten into more craft lagers than anything else. So on that note, I wanna be brewing a lot more lagers, hence this series. You could consider a Czech pale lager pretty much like a scaled down Czech Pilsner. It's got very similar ingredients, very similar process, and honestly, it's a pretty similar flavor as well, just of course, scaled down. It is the lager style that pioneered what eventually became the American lager. <laughs> Although very much so unlike modern day uh, American lagers, this is 100% barley malt. Despite it being 4% and relatively pale compared to its cousins, it is absolutely a complex beer full of flavor, and that's what we're targeting. I am gonna be taking the liberty to experiment with a few different ingredients in this beer that I haven't tried before. Uh, it's not the first time I've made a Czech Pale Lager, so I, pretty, I feel pretty comfortable experimenting in that way. Before we jump into the recipe though, I wanna thank a few organizations for helping make the video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, who carry all the ingredients that you need for this batch of beer. So be sure to check them out, especially for some of the harder to find ingredients that I'm gonna be showcasing today. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, who make the system that I'll be brewing this beer on today. It's gonna to be the 10 gallon, 240 volt system. This is a very sessionable beer style, and the BJCP says it can be as low in alcohol as 3%, um, going up to only a little bit over 4%. So I'm, I'm targeting the upper end of that, about 4% uh, ABV for a nice, crisp, refreshing lager. That means we don't really need that much grain. In fact, this beer is going to use 100% Pilsner malt, and not only that, a very special Pilsner malt, Czech grown, Czech malted barley. Uh, Pilsner malt from a maltster called Prostyov Malting. I think I'm pronouncing that properly, but I'm not sure. Anyway, this is a Czech maltster that's been around since the late 1800s, about the time when Pilsner started becoming a thing. And I'm really excited to see if it has any distinct difference in character from the typical Weirman floor malted Bohemian Pilsner, for example, that I might use otherwise. I'm targeting a relatively low OG of about 1040. And to get us there, we'll need about seven and three quarter pounds of this malt. For the hops in this beer, it's technically a smash beer, actually. Um, and instead of your traditional Sots hops that you would find in almost every Czech beer, we're actually gonna be switching it up and using Sterling. Sterling is a cross between Sots and Cascade, actually. It's got a lot of that Sots character and flavor, but it's also got a little bit of fruitiness from the Cascade. A little citrus should present itself nicely, I think, in this beer. Despite this being a relatively pale lager, one of the characteristics of Czech lagers is that they are really heavily hopped relative to a lot of their cousins. Sterling has a relatively high alpha acid concentration relative to Sots, so it's not unsurprising that we're going to be adding a lot less overall hop material, um, but we're still targeting, you know, that upper end of those style guidelines range. We're gonna start out with a first wort hop addition with just half an ounce of Sterling going in right after the mash is complete and as we bring it up to a boil, and then we're gonna add a 30 minute hop addition with another half ounce of sterling. And then we'll finish it off with one ounce of sterling at five minutes. I think that'll get us a really nice amount of flavor and aroma um, from the sterling without taking it overboard and still letting those malts shine through. For the water profile on this beer, the typical thing you're gonna do with a Czech lager is get as soft of water as possible. What I'm gonna be doing is brewing with straight RO water, adding nothing to it. The characteristic of Czech lagers, and one of the things that makes them so special and so good, is the fact that their water is so soft, free of minerals of any kind, 
and really just brings out the finest uh, in those delicate flavors. There's nothing wrong with cutting your water source with some distilled water or just using entirely distilled water or RO water or very, very light spring water might work as well. I've done all of those things in the past, um, but really just in my recommendation is just to go straight RO water, let it do its thing, um, and you're gonna get a nice soft character out of that. The yeast in the beer, I'm using a brand new yeast I haven't tried before, one that um, I think is gonna have a very good result. As far as liquid yeast goes, I give a ton of love to White Labs, the Y yeast, the Imperial yeast, and somewhat unfairly, I'm leaving out Omega. Not because I'm choosing to, but because I just haven't used them enough to really get familiar with their strains. And it's something I intend to change. So starting today, we're gonna be using Omega OYL 101 Pilsner 1. This is the H strain from Pilsner Urkel. Um, it is one of the classic Czech Pilsner strains and something that works really, really well for a Czech pale lager as well. And lastly for the mash, we're doing something that's a staple of Czech lager production, something that it's not totally necessary, but I think it really elevates the character of the beer, and that is a decoction mash. So decoction mashing, if you're not familiar with it, I recommend checking out the video that's gonna pop up in the corner right now where I teach you how to do it. Decoction mashing is a very old school, traditional way of mashing. It's been around for a long time, ever since these lagers got started, really. It's something that gives Czech lagers a very particular character. Um, it's not something that's done outside of the Czech Republic or Germany all that frequently. It's a bit of a difficult process to do as a home brewer, but I found it to be worth it. What it will do is it will add a little bit of flavor, I believe, to your beer, which deepens the malt character and enriches the flavor overall of the beer in general. Um, it's also gonna slightly darken the color due to the Maillard reactions that take place. Now, if you don't wanna go through the decoction mashing process, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's a malt that exists for this very reason called melanoidin malts. I would recommend in this case, adding maybe about a quarter pound of melanoidin malt to the recipe if you don't wanna go through with the decoction mash. I think the biggest reason why I enjoy decoction mashing though is just because it's a really manual process. It's a lot of fun to just go through it every so often. Anyway, the mash schedule for this beer is built around a Hoke Kurtz style step mash. So I'm doing half an hour at 148 degrees Fahrenheit and then a half an hour at 158 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by a mash out at 170 degrees for about 15 minutes. And I'm incorporating a decoction into the schedule in the easiest way possible by just doing a single decoction, which will take place during the second mash rest. So I'm gonna let the whole mash sit in there for about 30 minutes at 148. Then I'm gonna pull out a third of the mash volume, do a decoction with that, boil it for probably about 15 minutes, and then return it to the main mash to bring us to that 170 degree mash out temperature. And at that point, we'll be ready to continue on with the rest of the brew deck. Anyway, guys, I am excited to get this thing moving. So without further ado, let's jump into it. I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water into my 10 gallon, 240 volt claw hammer supply system, and I started to heat that up to the first rest temperature of 148 degrees Fahrenheit. While it was heating up, I milled out all of my grain, and normally at this time, I would add some sort of water salts into the water as it was heating up to achieve a particular water profile, but in this case, I chose not to because this is a check logger and we want that water profile to be extra soft. And one of the best ways to do that is to just not add anything in to the reverse osmosis water. So I left it as it was. Once I reached that target mash in temperature, I mashed in with the entire grain bill, uh, stirring it up thoroughly, just making sure we didn't have any clumps or anything like that. And I left it to recirculate for only a few minutes, about five minutes before pulling a pH measurement to confirm my pH. Because I didn't add any acidulated malt or lactic acid to the water before starting out, I was a little bit worried that it was not going to be on target, but it was in fact on target. I saw a pH of 5.1 measured hot, which in reality is probably a lot more like 5.4 uh, when it's cooled down. Either way, totally on target, and so I didn't do anything to adjust the pH and let the mash continue. I let the mash sit at 148 Fahrenheit for a total of 30 minutes before stepping it up to 158 Fahrenheit for the next step and simultaneously pulling out one third of the mash volume for a decoction. I used a one quart dipper to pull out one third of the mash volume of thick mash, which turned out to be about 12 quarts. And I transferred that into a separate kettle and then used the side burner on my gas grill to heat it to a boil. The entire time I was stirring the decoction, scraping it off the bottom of the kettle to prevent scorching and burning and bringing it to a boil for about 15 minutes before transferring it back into into the mash tun itself. This whole process took about 30 minutes, which was exactly the amount of time in that second step 
at 158 degrees. Adding the decoction back into the main mash resulted in bringing the temperature up close to that 170 degrees. Either way, I maintain that for about 15 minutes before removing the grain basket and letting that drain for another 15 minutes. As the grain basket was draining, I set the system to start uh, ramping up to a boil. And at this time, I also added in my first wort hops, which was half an ounce of sterling. Once I reached the full boil, I set the timer for 60 minutes. I let the boil continue for 30 minutes before adding in a half an ounce of sterling at the 30 minute mark, letting the boil continue furthermore for another 20 minutes. And at the 10 minute mark, I added in a whirl flock tablet as well as some yeast nutrients. Five minutes later, at the five minute mark, I added in one ounce of sterling. I let the boil continue for five more minutes before ending it and then conducting a quick whirlpool and transferring the wort into my Brewbuilt X2. I used the Brewbuilt X2 to further chill the wort down to an appropriate pitching temperature of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That took a few hours, but once it was complete, I pitched in my yeast starter of Omega OYL 101 Pilsner 1. Once the starter was pitched, I took an original gravity measurement and found it to be exactly on target at 1040, which is perfect. So then I just left it to ferment for the next several days. For the fermentation on this beer, there's a couple different approaches that you can take, but I'll start out by telling you what I'm gonna do and then give you the alternatives. So once again, I'm gonna be using Omega Yeast Labs Pilsner 1, uh, which is the Pilsner Urkel H strain. I'll be fermenting this one at about 48 degrees Fahrenheit, keeping it kind of on the lower side, I think, to keep this as clean as possible. Uh, the Pilsner Urkel strain is not exactly the cleanest lager strain out there, um, but it is absolutely a classic. It is very much notorious for producing loads of diacetyl. So what we're gonna do is, as that primary fermentation is reaching the end, and there's a few gravity points left, I'm gonna raise the temperature of the beer up to close to room temperature, actually, uh, and we're going to conduct a diacetyl rest for three to five days, maybe a bit longer than that, depending on how much diacetyl is in the beer. Technically, Czech lagers are quite permissible to have diacetyl in them. Um, it's not considered a flaw, except in large amounts. And it depends on the beer drinker if you like to have the diacetyl note in there. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I'm gonna just play that with my ear. I am gonna throw in some ALDC enzyme at yeast pitch as well to try and keep it under control. I'm thinking in the delicate flavors of a pale lager, it's very easy for the diacetyl to overwhelm everything else. So I really do recommend controlling it as much as possible if you're using this type of yeast. A couple alternative yeasts, if you wanna use the same strain, it's also available as Imperial L28 Urkel. I believe it's also available from Y yeast as Y yeast 2001, um, although that strain's kinda hard to find. I've had a great experience with Y yeast 2278 as well, check pills. Um, this is not the same strain from Pilsner Urkel, but it still is from Pilsner Urkel. As far as White Labs goes, I'd recommend White Labs 800 or 802, uh, both excellent strains for this one. You could also use a Southern German lager strain, so any of the Munich lager strains, it gets you a similar character. It's not quite the same as the Czech lager strain in my opinion, but it'll get you that maltiness that you're looking for. For dry options, I'd recommend S23 from Fermentis or Lalamand Diamond Lager. The point here is that you really want a lager yeast that is able to both simultaneously attenuate the lager down to a reasonable final gravity without being too sweet, but still give you lots and lots and lots of intense, rich malt flavor left over. You can get 90% of this beer's flavor from the mash tun and from the boil kettle, but the fermentation is the final piece that really puts it all together. So using a non-check lager yeast is gonna slightly change the overall character and using something like a pseudo lager, um, like a clean fermenting ale yeast or a Lutra Kvike or something like that, is gonna change the overall character of the beer quite significantly. So just keep that in mind. I'm not telling you not to do it because I'm not gonna tell you how to brew things, that's your decision, but it's my recommendation that you don't use that and go for a proper lager strain instead. The final ingredient for this beer, of course, is the lagering time. Using finings, you can get the appearance you need and you can get most of the mouthfeel that you need but there is really no substitute for long-term cold storage. I like to do this in the keg. Um, there's no need to tie up a fermenter to lager with unless you really want to. Um, but really, that beer is gonna clean itself up whether it's in the fermenter or in the keg, as long as you're leaving it at, honestly, serving temperatures works fine as well. And that's what usually I end up doing, is I end up kegging these beers when they're finished fermentation and when they're ready and letting them naturally clarify in the keg by just leaving it at the back of my kegerator for a long time. When that beer has been sitting in the keg for a month, it is a very different experience than when it's been just freshly tapped. 
If you enjoy Keller beers, nothing wrong with doing it a little bit early, but for me, I found I really just enjoy having that beer after it sat for a long time. Again, I'm not gonna tell you exactly how to do everything. This is just a recommendation, but in my experience, and I've made quite a few of these lagers, it is really well worth it to let it sit. This is also a beer you can pressure from it. I've actually made really, really good Czech Pilsners before under pressure. Um, it's absolutely something that works out well. Just keep in mind, pressure fermentation when taken a little far is going to significantly stress out the yeast and cause a lot of sulfur character, specifically in lagers, to develop. I'd recommend keeping the pressure on this one um, probably no higher than 10 PSI to really keep that under control and let the yeast do its thing without being stressed out. By pressure fermenting, you'll keep the esters under control, which is a good thing because nobody wants banana flavor in their lager, um, but it will potentially kick out some of that extra sulfur character. So as long as you're keeping that in mind, pressure fermentation is absolutely a fine way to do this. So just to recap, what I will be doing for this beer is fermenting it for about two weeks uh, at about 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Lager fermentations are much slower than ales, and so this is gonna take a little bit longer. Once that two weeks is up and we're close to the end of fermentation, I'll go ahead and raise it up to about 65 degrees for a diacetyl rest. We'll leave it there for three to five days. We'll do a forced diacetyl test to make sure the beer isn't presenting like an absurd amount of diacetyl. Once I keg it, I'll I'll just leave it in the keg and let it naturally clarify and lager itself in the back of my kegerator until it's ready, which could be anywhere from like two to six weeks, depending on how it wants to go. Uh, but either way, I'm excited for this beer. This is something I've been craving and I miss making Czech lagers. Uh, so it'll be really fun to see this when it's ready. So I'll catch you guys in several weeks. Till then, cheers. Fermentation for this beer went very well overall. Um, it actually completed its fermentation within about 10 days, hitting a relatively dry, uh, but still within range final gravity of 1008, making it a 4.2% beer, which is exactly what I had planned and targeted, which is awesome. Once the fermentation was complete, I went ahead and I transferred into a keg and I put it in the back of my kegerator to lager at uh, just about serving temperature. Turned out that three weeks was just about the right amount of time to get this beer to to drop out and be ready to serve. And because this is a Czech lager and I wanted to have a little extra fun with it, I hooked up my Czech side pole lucre faucet for serving this one. This beer is called Meet Me in Prague and it comes in at 4.2% ABV and about 30 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it is pouring a beautiful pale golden color. Um, not as pale as a German Pils by any stretch of the imagination, but definitely has a nice light Pilsner malt color to it with these beautiful gold highlights. It is pretty clear overall, however there's a lot of humidity on the glass and that does make it difficult to actually see that clarity. Serving it out of the side pull faucet delivers an incredible dense, rich, wet, white foam head uh, that is just absolutely beautiful to look at and sticks around forever. All right, so let's go in for aroma first. Overall, and this might be a function of the glass, um, the aroma on this one's not particularly strong. I'm getting mostly notes of uh, bready malt character. Overall, a little bit of an herbal spice in there, um, but really not too much else. There's no sulfur and there's no diacetyl coming off of the uh, aroma. It just smells very refreshing. It smells like it's gonna be a nice, tasty, pale lager. But now, let's go in for mouthfeel. Oh, wow. This mouthfeel is unlike anything else in the lager world. It is soft, it is delicate, it is just like 
super gentle. Everything is a rounded character. There's no sharpness, there's no crispiness, in fact, and it's actually supposed to be that way because what it does is it presents all the flavors of this beer in a much more delicate way than, say, like a crispy German Pils, which should have those edges and it should be sharp. This is not that case. This is a very different beer entirely. Despite being super soft and easy and drinkable, it's actually pretty highly carbonated. One thing that's nice about that Luker faucet though is that it knocks out a lot of that carbonation in the process of pouring the beer. So that's what gives you that delicious, amazing, dense, fluffy head on that thing. But it also changes the mouthfeel slightly to bring more of that smooth character to the forefront and to really emphasize the delicate flavors, especially with the hops, um, that this beer really can bring to the forefront. But now, let's talk about those flavors specifically. Mm. Oh my God. I love this beer. This is precisely what I was envisioning when I wanted to make a nice, crushable, but really flavorful pale lager for the summer. Um, this is amazing. It, <laughs> it has so much interesting character to it. And there's a lot to break down here actually. So first and foremost, we'll talk yeast because I think that's important. The yeast character in this is actually quite clean overall. I mean, it is a lager and it should be that way. The lack of diacetyl in this to some Czech brewers and some Czech drinkers might be considered a flaw, in fact. Um, but for this type of beer, I think it would get in the way and that's not a, it's a very delicate dance and not one that I wanna like really play around with too much. So I'm glad that there's no diacetyl in this. It does still push forward some nice malt flavors though. This was the Pilsner Urkel H strain which compared to something like Wai's 2278, which I've used in the past, this is a very different flavor. What I'm getting here is less diacetyl. I'm getting a slightly drier finish and I'm actually getting a little less of the, the honey-like maltiness being pushed to the forefront. But at the end of the day, you're getting a much cleaner beer in the process. This yeast is a lot less dirty than the 2278. Although sometimes I really am a pretty big fan of the extra maltiness you get from the D-strain. What would really be interesting is if I fermented this with something like WLP802, which is the Budvar strain. I expected that would actually be pretty similar to the H-strain's performance, but maybe with a little bit cleaner of a character overall. The yeast is great, but let's talk about the real, real stars of this show here, the malt and the hops. I've never used this particular maltster before, and I am super happy with it. The Prostiov malts uh, came through as a super, like, white bready kind of character that's extremely flavorful, very tasty. I'm not getting as much of a honey character as when I've used something like Vireman Bohemian pills before. Um, I'm getting a lot more pronounced and, quite honestly, delicious bready character out of it, uh, specifically that white bread, and it's so crushable in this form. It still retains a good amount of sweetness behind it, despite finishing at 10.08. Makes it very drinkable, makes it very refreshing, um, but also just, it's a beer that tastes like you're drinking a beer. And you know, that's something that's kind of lacking nowadays. So I'm actually really happy with the way that that malt presented itself. For a 100% Pilsner malt beer, this has so much freaking flavor. The decoction mash, I still maintain, brings out some of that extra character. I wouldn't necessarily say though that it's an enormous impact, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's still a lot of fun to do. A little more intense of a malt character, a little bit richer, maybe a little bit of bread crust, um, maybe something like that. If I didn't tell you I did a decoction mash in this thing, you wouldn't be tasting it. So it's not a huge impact. And again, just toss a little melanoid malt in there if you wanna do something like that without the extra effort. But something about the decoction just makes me more like just tied to the beer. It just makes it taste better because I put more work into it and it's just, it's just extra fun for me, really. And not everyone agrees with that, that's okay. It's your beer, brew it the way you want to. This is mine, I brew it the way I want to. But really one of the most fascinating parts about this particular beer is the hop character. So Sterling is a hop that I have not really used on the end of the boil before. I've used it at the beginning of the boil as a bittering hop, it's a great bittering hop. Um, but I've never really used it at the end and I thought, Maybe a blend of the Saws and the Cascade character would come out really, really cool, and it did. Out of the two hops that it has lineage with, I really would say it shares the most similarity with Sots. And I'm getting more Sots character than Cascade overall. It does just have that extra punch though, which is really fun. It's got this like really nice herbal black pepper note um, that really plays super well with the yeast and with the, with the malts in this. And it has this really nice lemony character, a little bit of that spiciness that you get from Sots. It's awesome. But on top of that, you do get the little grapefruit. You get that little cascade note and 
It is super refreshing. It's not fruity by any means, but there is a citrus character in there that's not just the lemon from Sots. Once again, it is full on summer. It is hot as hell outside. And this is an absolute thirst quenching beer. It is perfect for this occasion. It's perfect for this kind of weather. It makes me feel refreshed. It is exactly what I wanted out of this beer. And to kick off a series of Czech lager videos, this is something I'm very happy to have. It is really hard for me to find flaws with this beer, but when I'm really getting down to it and I'm nitpicking as hard as I possibly can, there is one thing about this beer. I'm getting a little bit of a phenolic character coming out of this one. It's so hard to pick up, but when this thing warms up a little bit and it's been out for a little while, you're getting a small hint of a little bit of like a rubbery character. Um, and that is a lager phenol and that's not a desirable character. It's not there in any sort of offensive uh, quantity. It's not really something you notice until you've really just had a lot of this beer. Um, and at the end of the day, I don't actually hate it overall. It doesn't detract too much from things, but it is a flaw. As to the origin of that flavor, it's either I fermented it too cold, which I doubt because these yeasts really do perform very well at that temperature. It's probably that I didn't let it sit on the yeast long enough to really clean things up. So as I wouldn't really change any ingredients there. I would just give it a little bit more time to condition on the yeast and help that yeast clean up its additional flavors that it creates during the process of fermentation. But otherwise, it's really a great beer and I'm really happy with it. Anyway, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I am super stoked to be back. It's gonna be a while before I get back on the content train, um, but I've got plenty of great stuff brewing. I've got plenty of great stuff planned for the rest of the summer and into the fall. A lot more lagers like this one actually are coming down the pipeline. And so I'm excited to get brewing some more stuff and sharing it all with you. If you found this video useful at all, please just do me a favor, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. This just helps my channel become a little bit more visible to the rest of YouTube and discoverable by other home brewers out there. So if you liked it, odds are somebody else will too. So please go ahead and promote it as best you can. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. This is available on my merchandise store along with plenty of other designs. You can find that merchandise store down in the description box below the video itself. I also have a Patreon and my patrons are really the ones that are really responsible for keeping up the production quality of this channel, keeping things moving and just really making a big difference for helping me to fund the production upgrades that have been taking place over the last several years. A lot of things are happening on that side of the house and it means a lot to me to have the support of my patrons. So I really appreciate it. If Patreon is not your thing though, I also have channel memberships and there's the super thanks button. Those things also help out quite a bit, just in a different way. And then of course I have an Amazon store as well, which is also available down in the description box. If you wanna follow me in more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook and I've got plenty of stuff that's been coming to Instagram and Facebook despite my content gap on YouTube here. So please go check that stuff out as well. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a ton to me that you guys are still here because these videos take a lot of work. They take a long time to produce and it's been a lot of work trying to just even get this single one out. Um, but I really appreciate that you're here. And so yeah, this one goes out to you guys. I'm gonna just uh, top off my, uh, my thumbnail beer here. And yeah, I'm gonna show just how drinkable this particular beer is. <laughs> so if you're still watching, this one goes out to you. And until the next one, cheers all. Ah. Good, man.